So here we are again and we continue making this rather long winded review of the Book of Why. In the last video we had just reached um, chapter 6 Paradoxes Galore. So this is a, this is a rather short uh, chapter in the book and um, it, it basically explains some of the paradoxes that usually appear in, in statistics uh, or more in probability and um, it also, besides explaining them, it, it, it indicates how using um, the rules of, of, of causal inference and, and uh, the arrow diagrams, they become much easier to, to understand. So these paradoxes all basically highlight the conflict between um, causal intuitions and relations and pure statistical statistics and probability. So the first one is the famous Monty Hall one. And um, again, you have lots of videos explaining it. I'm not going to go into details of it here, but basically what, what, what the author explains is that it, it can be solved using Bayesian reasoning and it's very anti-intuitive. That is, uh, causal diagrams would also allow us to solve it pretty easily. We have some examples of, of different ones here yeah. that, that help you deal with this issue. Uh, the second one is Bergson's paradox, uh, which is a collider-induced correlation. Remember, colliders have some some effects in producing bias. Like here, you can see the chart. So this is the same as uh, as filling two coins and only registering at least one head, or uh, the handsome boyfriends are all jerks sort of of of, of paradox. Uh, the paradox arises because you have excluded one possible outcome, which you, you never dwell in. In this case, in the case of handsome boyfriends are all jerks, because you never go out with ugly <laughs> boyfriends who are also jerks. That that means you you overrepresent the percentage of handsome boys who are actually jerks. And finally, the Simpson's paradox, uh, which again you will encounter watching any video about probability of statistics. And this comes mostly from aggregating, but also sometimes from partitioning. So how you group the data, how you partition it, is, is a non-trivial issue sometimes, as it, as it can create apparently paradoxical results. So uh, uh, the, the general type of Simpson's paradox is when like, you, you analyze the data and something looks bad for x, it looks bad for Y, but when you add X and Y together, it's apparently good. And of course, this is very counterintuitive. And uh, um, you, you really have to dig into the causal story behind the data that allows one to easily avoid the confounders and the paradox. And, and, and that privileges one type of reading of the data over another that would be just as statistically valid, but which, because it ignores causality and causation, well, might lead you astray or might lead you to, to, to adopting one method or other of partitioning the data, which is not the appropriate one. Okay, next chapter is uh, chapter 7, Beyond Adjustment, the Conquest of Mount Intervention. So most of what we've seen until now and uh, most of what traditional statistics does is in the first rung of the ladder of causation. Intervention moves you into the second rung of the ladder of uh, causation. Yeah. And how can we deal with, uh, with issues of, uh, of, 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 of intervention? Well, basically, and there's a very good chart at the beginning that maps the routes to mount intervention, uh, you basically have um, four routes. There are the easy ones, relatively easy ones, which would be the backdoor adjustment, of which um, something has been explained in previous chapters. There's the front door adjustment, there's the use of instrumental variables, and then there's the hard route, which is the do calculus. This chapter is pretty dense. Uh, if you don't have mathematical experience, especially of statistics, you're going to sweat a bit in this chapter, and you'll probably have to read it a couple of times. So let's start with the backdoor adjustment. This is the more familiar. Uh, what you do here is basically you control for confounders and block all the backdoor paths. So you, you could imagine this perhaps as a cake model. You check each stratum of the cake and then make calculate an average. Yeah? And um, in these cases, you sometimes can use linear approximation. It's a useful tool for lots of variables with numbers. Uh, it's expandable to confounders. And you only have to be careful with blocking all the backdoor paths. If you want to use the, the backdoor adjustment uh, for, for, for calculating probabilities of, of, 
of interventions, you really must make sure that you've blocked all the backdoor paths. Uh, another possibility is the front door adjustment. Uh, in this case, basically what you do is you express the probability of y, given that we do x, in terms of a do-free probability, in terms of do-free probabilities using a formula. So you have to adjust for two variables instead of one, as in the back door, uh, as in the back door adjustment, uh, and they lie on the direct path from y to x, not to confound us in back doors. So, for example. For smoking, here you have an example of this sort of situation here, where you can use the front door adjustment. Yeah. This this one. This is the the basic setup for the front door criterion. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the 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 conditions, as we said, you adjust for two variables. They lie on the direct path from x to well, from y to x or from x to y, yeah, not through confounders or, or backdoors. Uh, so using this method you can eliminate uh, confounders even without data on the confounder through the shielded mediator which would be M in this case. Yeah? And uh, experiments have shown that even when the mediator is not shielded, if the bias isn't too strong, to all practical purposes, you can ignore it. So the advantage of using the front door adjustment is that it's a possible alternative to randomized controlled trials, and it's basically cheaper and easier to implement. Okay, the, the difficult one, and the next one that the author talks about, is the do calculus. Yeah. So, uh, with the two previous examples, you were able to extract an intervention into just observations. So, so, so that allows you to guess or to calculate what the results of the intervention would be without having to actually do it, or just with observations. But uh, can this always be done, or at least can we know in advance? Is there some mathematical formalism that would do this for us? Well, in fact, there is, which is the two calculus that was invented by uh, Judea Pearl. Now, you, for, for, for using the do calculus, you have to um, rely on three axioms. So axiom number one is, if a variable w is irrelevant to y, you can ignore it. That is to say, the probability of y, given that we do x and z, and w is equal to the probability of y, given that we do x and z. That is, you can ignore the w if w is irrelevant for y. So that allows us to prune through some, some variables. Uh, the second axiom... No, they're explained here. So the second uh, axiom is if, variab if a variable z or variables, more than one, block all the backdoor paths, then doing x, which is uh, uh, the main definition of, of intervention, becomes just cx. So the probability of y, given that you do x and z, and there's z, is equal to the probability of y such that x and z. So, so what you're doing here is you're trying to eliminate the the do x operator to change it into something simpler, into something that is you know, just observations at the previous level for the, for the calculations. And the third axiom is we can always remove do x if there are no direct arrows from x to y. So the probability of y such that we do x would in this case be equal to the probability of y. So uh, the front door adjustment formula there is a mathematical formula which I haven't told you about, but it's the one you use for front or adjustments. That was discovered and derived from the axioms of the do calculus, and researchers also proved uh, the completeness of, of, of the do calculus if, uh, if there is an, a possible exit. Now, what problems might arise from using the do calculus? It's more complicated to use. Uh, sometimes it's very tough to compute, even if there is a solution. Mm. You know, it's proved that there's polynomial solutions to finding all causal effects, but it still might be too tough to compute. Um, but, but, but there is a solution, a polynomial solution, which means a solution that is achievable within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, another problem would be transportability. So do calculus allows us to work even when the x is unmeasurable, if there is a close enough variable z. And uh, transparency might be an issue. Uh, uh, it makes some problem solutions easy to see and solve if there is transparency. And finally, the last uh, adjustment tool would be the use of instrumental uh, variables. 
Yeah. Here, the author explains a very interesting case, Dr. Snow in Victoria, London, uh, in the middle of a cholera epidemic. And uh, well, the book explains the anecdote very well, how he, uh, um, he, he, he guessed that the water coming from a water provider was polluted because it was coming from a, a lower, lower area of the River Thames, which received fecal matter. Whereas uh, another water company was 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 distributing cleaner water, and, and you could you'd see that those who drank from from one company got sick or more sick than the ones who drank from the other. And well, he uses this anecdote to explain what instrumental variables are. Instrumental variables have to satisfy three conditions. First of all, there is no incoming arrow. Uh, second, it affects an intermediate variable. And three, there is no direct arrow to the end point variable. There's a chart here that would be helpful. Here. So, for example, this is the general setup for instrumental variables, which satisfies the, the, the three criterion that we have mentioned. So, Z, for example, has no incoming arrow. It affects an intermediate variable, which is X. Yeah. And uh, there is no direct arrow between Z and Y, the endpoint variable. Yeah? So uh, using instrumental variables has the same effect as the front door adjustment. We can find the effect without controlling for the confounder. So we might not have information about the confounder. And, and sometimes they allow us to go beyond what can be done with uh, the do calculus. And with this, we finish chapter 7. Uh, this time I haven't moved my chronometer, so I'm not sure how much I've been speaking. Probably too much. Yeah, 11 minutes. Okay. Let me maybe explain chapter 8, and, and, and I will leave one last video for chapter 9 and 10 in the conclusion. So chapter 8, after the author has explained uh, the second rung of the level of causation, chapter 8 is about counterfactuals, which is the last rung in the level of causation, the third rung. Um, so counterfactuals would be hypothetical. So in, in, in the first level, we observe what, what, what evidence we have. In the second level, we intervene or we, or we, or we try to guess or calculate the consequences of, inter, of interventions. If I do this, what happens? Uh, and in the third level, you move to a more abstract realm of counterfactuals. If I had done this, or if this had been done, which has not been done, what would have happened? So th this third level is a sort of personalized causation for a specific individual. Mm, so you can center on one individual. The problem with 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 uh, with, with cases in, uh, in well in other in, in other cases is that you can't really focus on the individual because you, for, for example, when you do a randomized control trial, uh, these people smoke, these people don't smoke. Well, you can't do that in a in a real randomized control trial, but. Bear with me. Uh, like, like, like you see, okay, these, th this group of people who smoked got cancer, this group of people who didn't smoke didn't get cancer, but how could we have done the experiment with one individual? If one individual in this group that smoked hadn't smoked, would he have gotten cancer? So this would be the sort of personalized causation that um, counterfactuals allow us to, 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 to dwell in. To dwell in. Okay, what the might have been. So um, you can use causal diagrams and potential outcomes for this. Uh, there's three types of, of, of this sort of causation. It might be necessary, it might be sufficient, or it might be necessary and sufficient. So there are some antecedents for the use of, um, of, of, of um, counterfactuals, Thucydides, uh, for example, in, in the history of the Peloponnesian War. But it's Hume, the one who sets the tone to discussing about these issues. So, so he gives some definitions of causality, like the regularity definition and the counterfactual definition. The second one, apparently better than the first one. Uh, other philosophers and thinkers have developed this. David Lewis, for example, talked about uh, many worlds and uh, the uniformity of closest choice. And there are also you know, like structural models that you can use for, for, for working with, with this, like deleting arrows in a causal diagram. So uh, there was a, a, a previous model that is talked about in this book by, by Rubing, YXU, that is a counterfactual for the individual. And uh, how do you work with this? Well, sometimes people have tried just filling tables and using elements from rung one of the ladder of causation. Um, 
but this doesn't work. It's, it gives incorrect results. Right? Uh, an example is given about guessing fictional data, taking into account different outcomes of education and earning. But uh, like, if you don't use counterfactual tools that uh, the, the author explains here, you will get wrong, 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 wrong answers just from using the conventional tools. And uh, what else can we say about this? Uh, we, we get an example. The author explains, I think, the SCM method, that is the structural causal model, which has three steps, abduction, action, prediction. And uh, this is a model that is very similar to what Rubin, which is another specialist, does in his attempts at incorporating counterfactuals. Um, the SEM is the one developed by Julia Perl, and it uses causal diagrams. Rubin does not. Now, so, so basically what he explains is these two models, the Rubin model and the, the, the SCM models, are models for using counterfactuals, but the author says, you know, his method is, I wouldn't say better, but less complicated, definitely. So for Rubin's models of, of, of measuring um, counterfactuals, there are three assumptions of the of the Rubin model. 16 minutes, okay, very quickly. Uh, Sudva is the first assumption. You treat each, each unit has the same treatment effect regardless of, of the treatments of the other people. Uh, the second one is consistency, like for example, if you recovered from, from a medical trial, you would have also recovered if it were an experiment. That is, you recover, you imagine if in an experimental context you would have recovered as well. That would be consistency. That there is no change because uh, of, of, of the background. And ignorability is the third one. And this is the messiest one, but it's the key. And it's difficult to explain, but it's more or less something like different groups would have had different outcomes. No, different groups which would have had different outcomes are evenly distributed between the trial and the control group. So uh, I think I've made a little mess of explaining the, these assumptions of the Rubin model for, for measuring counterfactuals. Uh, the key idea you should get is that it's really complicated and easy to decide wrongly on the third factor, ignorability. Ignorability forces you to make some guesses, and uh, it's very easy to get those guesses wrong. So SCM um, is more transparent. And there's this thing called the response function, which is key for counterfactuals in, in SCM and is uh, quite different and quite, in some aspects, opposed to what Judea Pearl had done in previous work. And he, you know, he gives examples of how this would work, which I'm not going to stop on, but, you know, he explains in this chapter, necessary causes, sufficient causes, climate change. So he explains both in the law, in, lay, in law cases and in climate change cases, how counterfactuals can be uh, arrived at and um, speculated about. Uh, using these tools of, of, of SCM. And that will be all for this video.